Thank you guys for being here. Uh, we've got week three of our series, uh, Jeremiah, God Can Use Me. Um, and I, I think this has been an awesome series. We've, some of the stuff has been pretty heavy, but it's been awesome uh, just to come together and really be challenged um, and how we, can to, how we can see how God can use us. It's, it's difficult at times. Some of us think, I don't have much to offer, but we've been seeing that Jeremiah had something to offer, and we, d- we have the same thing today. So uh, if you're a first-time guest with us here in the building or maybe you're online watching for the very first time, I just want to say thank you and appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate that you are here. We here as a church, we want to be as welcoming as we can. Uh, we know that it can be difficult to walk into to a place for the very first time and to not really know anybody. And so um, we just want to say welcome to you. If you are brand new today, we'd love for you to fill out a connection card with us just so we can follow up with you. Uh, we're doing that digitally now, so all you have to do is text WELCOME to 605 605- 205-7755. Um, that would be awesome. If you could fill that out again, if you're in person or if you're online, a connection card is going to get sent to you. You can send that back to us. We'd love to just follow up with you. And we ha- also have a free gift for you as well. So go ahead and do that. And maybe you have a prayer request for us today. Again, we as a church, we just want to be able to partner with you and walk alongside you wherever you're going through today. So you can text prayer to that same number as well if you have a prayer request. And finally, if, we, uh, if you are maybe feeling a little disconnected or maybe you are looking for your next step. Maybe you're saying, I've been here for a while, and I just don't really know where to go from here. I kind of want to get involved with something, but I don't really know what to do. Um, you can text CONNECT to that number as well, and that will be uh, just a, a great opportunity for us to follow up with you and just to see how we can uh, grow closer to Christ together to live out our mission and vision here. And hey, we, we've got some things coming up today, or in the next few weeks, next few months, but we just wanted to take some time to celebrate with you guys Uh, Maybe you're in here before uh, service, or maybe online you were watching uh, the five-minute countdown before. Um, We had our Serve Our City Week this week, and if you didn't know what was going on, maybe you saw it all over Facebook or whatever else, it was an awesome week. We started off with kickball. There was quite a few people out there, and save your applause for later, but my team won, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was not rigged. It was not rigged. (laughs) My team won, but it was awesome. Just, again, a great t- opportunity for us to come out. We, we've just been, it seems like everyone's been apart for so long. It was just great to be together as a church. And then all throughout the week, I think there was like 200, and, 200 plus opportunities, and you guys filled every single one of them. It was so great. Every single opportunity was just, um, it was filled, and we were able to serve and be in our community. Uh, we were downtown serving meals. I think we were at Feeding South Dakota, and we put together like 490 boxes we served, I mean, 100 plus meals at Laundry with Love. Again, so many awesome things that happened this week. So we just want to say thank you for all of you that were involved. Um, and with that, we're going to continue on in worship today. So thank you. Yeah, that's right. 204 different opportunities where we served this week, which is phenomenal. So thank you, Good News, for doing that. Thank you for the, uh, just using the gifts and talents uh, that God has given you. You know, the last couple of weeks, we've been asking a question. And that question is this, what breaks your heart? We've been wrestling with Jeremiah as Jeremiah has wrestled through some of those same, very same questions. What breaks your heart? Because when we discover sometimes what breaks our heart, it's the very thing that motivates us and moves us to be the hands and the feet and the voice of God to a world that's dying. And so again, we ask ourselves, what breaks your heart? You know, sometimes um, God moves us with things that breaks our heart where we have to confront certain things. It's one of the things we're going to learn tonight and today with, with uh, Jeremiah is that uh, the things that we sometimes have to confront. And you know, Jeremiah is not the only one that ever was the only one that had to confront things that were going on in the world. In fact, listen to this out of Luke. Here's the story of John the Baptist. It says this. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling him in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. 
Then listen to this. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of your tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. How do you think that message went over? Not real well. Those who came out, those who were the religious leaders, those who thought they had it, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all of those people who looked and said, yeah, we got this figured out. And John says to them, hey, the ax is already laid at the root of your tree. Anybody know what happens to John? Again, remember this. Sometimes we are called to confront because things break our heart. It's the very thing it broke John's heart. And so he had to confront the people. Do you know what they did to John? Yeah, they cut his head off and brought it on a platter. Sometimes it's hard. Today we're going to discover how in the midst of some of those moments when God challenges us to speak, how do we do it? Let's pray as we continue. Father, Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together today to worship you, to celebrate you, and to give thanks unto your name. Father, I pray that for some of us today, as we've come here, God, there are things around us, things in us that we must confront that we must speak into. And God, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it puts us at odds against people that we love. And so today, God, may you encourage us, inspire us and speak to us and remind us, God, that just like Jeremiah, just like John, just like Jesus, God, you are always with us, even in the midst of the struggle. So we love you, we celebrate you, and now, God, we want to sing and praise your name because you are worthy, and we love you, and it's in your name we pray, amen. Hey, if you're here today, I would love for you to stand. Let's stand and let's sing, and if you're joining us online, you certainly may join us singing as well. Let's celebrate the name of Jesus. Well, hey, church, it's good to see you guys here. Let's go ahead and let's stand here as we sing, as we praise. Let's get our hands up. Come on. We're going to sing to God. Here we go. From the front to the back. Come on, we got to get our hands up. If you're online, join us. Here we go. I want to scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And we'll sing. And I'll sing because you are good And I'll dance because you are good And I'll shout because you are good You are good to me, to me, oh Lord Let's sing this out Nothing and no one Nothing and no shine as bright as day. Your love amazes me. I'll sing, and I'll sing because you are good, and I'll dance because you are good, and I'll shout. 
out. Because you are good, you are good to me, to me, and I'll sing. Because you are good, and I'll dance. Because you are good, and I'll shout. Because you are good, you are good to me. With a cry, with a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim. We sing it out. You are good, you are good, in the sun or rain, my life celebrates, you are good, you are good, we sing it with a cry, with a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim, come on church, you are good. You've got a shout of praise. Come on. One day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls. One day there'll be no more children longing for hope. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the promised land. One day there'll be no more lies taken too soon. One day there'll be no more need for a hospital room. One day every tear will fall, will be wiped by his hands. We will see the promised land. We will see the promised land. Hallelujah. There will be healing from this heartbreak. We've been feeling. Sing in the darkest night. Because we know that the light will come. There will be healing. Hallelujah. be no more anger left in our eyes. One day the color of our skin won't cause a divide. One day we'll be families standing hand in hand. We will see the promised land. We will see the promised land.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity to worship. And thank you, God, now for the opportunity to look into your word. I pray, Father, that you will open our eyes and you would allow us to see with unveiled eyes, God, that which you would have for us today. And so, Lord, um, you know, as we come, Father, we come from many different backgrounds, many different situations. For some of us, God, we're here today and, and we are on cloud nine because, God, you have done amazing things this week. But for some of us, God, we come and we are at the very depths and we feel broken. And I trust, God, that wherever we are in that continuum, today you can meet us and you can speak life into bones that are weary and broken. God, you can speak hope where it feels as though there is no hope. And God, you can inspire us to speak when you want us to speak. May we not remain silent one more moment or one more day when you have challenged us. So we love you. We thank you. And uh, God, again, we ask you to speak now for it's in your name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated, my friends. And uh, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online, I would love for you to open your Bibles with me today to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 20. If you're like me, I kind of like the uh, printed version. That's what I like. And so if, uh, if you've got that, you can open that. But if not, if you've got a, a, a smartphone or a tablet, you can go ahead and uh, again find Jeremiah chapter 20. And before we dive in today, I want you to look at these questions. We're going to put some questions up here. These are some questions. If you've got your smartphone, take a picture of those right now, will you? Because here's what I'm going to ask you to do with those. Uh, at some point, I'm going to ask you that with our, those you're worshiping with today or uh, somebody, just have a conversation around these questions because hopefully we're going to uncover a little bit about what God says and, and some of the ways that God can help us in the midst of some of these very questions. So did you get a picture of them? I hope you've got it there. Again, we need to be in Jeremiah chapter 20 today. So Jeremiah chapter 20, we are going to look at the 13 verses through there. And uh, so if you're there, that is wonderful. Hold that spot because I, uh, I want to ask you again some, some questions as we begin today. And, and again, one of the questions that we've asked over and over is this, what breaks your We've really been wrestling with that. And I'm not going to let it go because I think, again, that there are times that that which breaks our heart is what motivates us to make a change or to do something different than what we are currently doing. So what breaks your heart? We listed off some things last week. We said, does it break your heart that since 1973, 63 million babies have been aborted in the United States? Does it break your heart when young women are sex trafficked in the United States and here in South Dakota as well? Does it break your heart that out of the 20 poorest counties in all of the United States, four of them are in South Dakota? All of them are Indian reservations. Does that break your heart? Or how about this? Does it break your heart to know that you need to confront somebody about something and you don't do it? Think about that for a moment. Have you ever had to confront somebody or hold someone accountable? Maybe in your job... You are in some kind of management position, and you've had to say to someone, um, hey, I'm, I'm just not sure this is working out for you. Um, by Friday, you might want to be looking for something different. Have you ever had to have that conversation with somebody? Or have you ever had to go to someone and say, hey, I just want you to know, I believe really uh, the way that you're living right now is contrary to what Scripture and how Scripture calls us to live. 
have you ever had to hold someone accountable and call them and call their actions and their sins what they are? And I'll be the first to tell you this. You guys all know this. I'm not a confrontation kind of guy. I hate it. I would rather sweep it under the rug and then cover it. But it doesn't always help. In fact, there are times it does more harm than it does good. So, have you ever had to confront someone or hold someone accountable? And then I wonder this, how did it go? <clears throat> what was the outcome? Because sometimes it, sometimes it goes well. Sometimes the people will change. And you come back and you're, you have this great relationship. And they're like, man, I wish somebody would have said that to me way earlier. I should have changed a long time ago. And I didn't. I'm sorry. I get it now. And they change. And it's wonderful. But sometimes how does it go? <laughs> right. <laughs> Luann, yeah, it's like this. It's not fun. And sometimes... I mean, I've lost friends because of things that I said, hey, this is what I see and I think a change needs to take place. And they're like, see ya. I'm not going to listen to you. And it's that stuff then that, that breaks my heart. But here's the thing. You're not the first person, nor will you be the last person who was ever called and asked to hold someone accountable for what they're doing. In fact, believe it or not, it's something that the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to hold each other accountable in the things that we do, the things that we say, the ways that we live. Really, that's part of the responsibility of the church is to hold each other accountable. We want to do this. We want to hold the world accountable, but we can't because the world doesn't play in our game. They're playing in their own game that has nothing to do with Jesus. But we are held accountable to a different standard than the world. And we are to hold each other accountable. But how does it go? What happens when we hold someone accountable in the church? See ya. I'll go to a different church. I don't need what you're selling. Okay. And you know what? Again, we're not the first people to hold people in the church accountable, and we won't be the last. It was one of the responsibilities that Jeremiah had, was to help hold the people of God accountable to a standard that they were called to live and which they were not. In fact, get this, if you went back and you read uh, chapter 19, it would probably uh, make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Because Jeremiah brings the religious leaders and the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah, and God says this, bring them out of the city to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is the valley of refuge for Jerusalem. So he brings them out to this place where, where this is where they bring their garbage. This is where they, and there is a, a fire that burns continually there. You bring your garbage there and you burn it there. And Jeremiah brings them out there and he says, hey, I just, and he's got a clay pot in his hand. He says, hey, I just want you to know I have a message for all of you from God. And here's that message. You have done stuff that has gone beyond what God ever imagined you would do. You have filled the city of Jerusalem with idols. You have burned incense to those idols you have shed innocent blood in Jerusalem and you have offered your children in the fire as a sacrifice to foreign gods and because of that here's what God says I'm about to do something to Jerusalem that will make the hair on the arm stand up to those who hear what is about to take place. Because I am about to shut up Jerusalem so much so that guess what? You will eat the flesh of your sons and your daughters because you will be that hungry. And I am about to destroy 
Jerusalem. And then Jeremiah takes that clay pot that's in his hand and he breaks it. And it falls into a thousand pieces on the ground. And he says to the, those religious leaders who are there, he says, this is what God is about to do to Jerusalem. What a great message, huh? Wouldn't you love to be Jeremiah? Did you bring this message and you say, this is what it is? Well, listen, I'd love for you to hear the, the way that it ends. Because this is, uh, and you don't have to turn there. This is Jeremiah 19. But listen what it says, Jeremiah 19, 15. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Listen, I am going to bring on this city and all the villages around it. Every disaster I pronounced against them. Because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. So it begins with this, this fact that Jeremiah comes and he has to confront. There is a confrontation that takes place. And again, we said this, not all of us like confrontation. In fact, many of us would prefer to say, nope, I'll step back. I'll just, you guys go do what you want to do. I don't want to have to mess with that. It's going to get ugly. It's going to get messy. And that's exactly what happens for Jeremiah. But Jeremiah knows that God has spoken through him. Remember, we looked back very early in Jeremiah's ministry when he said, God, look, I'm too young. God said, don't say you're too young. Jeremiah said this, I can't speak very well. And God said, hey, don't say that you can't speak. I will put words in your mouth and you will speak for me. And so sometimes this thing that God does in us to speak, it sometimes begins with a confrontation. Maybe you've been there. Again, maybe you've had to confront somebody before. Maybe you've confronted a loved one and that's just how it begins. By saying, hey, here's where we are and this is what I see. But then... Listen to this as we go through. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 20 because guess what? Jeremiah does what God says to do. There's this confrontation. He tells them this is what's going to take place. He breaks the clay pot. He says this is what's going to happen to Jerusalem. But listen to the consequences starting in Jeremiah 20 verses 1 through 2. When the priest, Peshur, the son of Amur, the official in charge of the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things in chapter 19, Look at what happens. He had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. Wait a minute. Jeremiah just did what God asked him to do. He said, take this clay pot. Jeremiah didn't do that on his own. God told him to do that. And God said, go and tell the people this is what's going to happen. He did exactly what God told him to do. But look at the consequences. The leaders take him and they beat him. And it says that they put him in stocks, meaning that they put him in this box. And it is such a box that you are, uh, you're moved and your hands are shackled in there. Your feet are shackled in there. And it is such that they left him in it overnight. And it is painful because you cannot move and your body is twisted in a way that you can't straighten it or move it. And Jeremiah is in there all night long. There's a part where I look and I go, wait a minute, God. If you asked us to do it, if you ask us to speak, how can there be consequences like this? Did you see that there was a representative from Georgia who passed away this week, a man by the name of John Lewis, who marched with Martin Luther King Jr. I did some reading up on, on uh, John Lewis. One of the things that John Lewis was a part of was a thing called Bloody Sunday. Again, you know, here's the thing. We're trying to do a good job of getting rid of our history there's some things in history that we need to make sure that we don't miss. And I knew very little about Bloody Sunday. But in March of 1965, a group of black people marched from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama for, for the right to vote. 
And one of the things, it's a 50-mile march, and John Lewis was one of those who marched. And when they crossed the county line heading into Montgomery, do you know what happened to them? They were beaten. Beaten. And John Lewis was beaten by the police so bad that he fractured his skull and had to have a plate put in. That you look and you go, wait a minute, what? God, I thought this was what you wanted us to do, and this is the consequence of it? What might God be asking you to do? Where you go, I'm just not sure the consequences weren't exactly what I thought that they would be. But let's keep going on in the story. Starting at verse 3 now of Jeremiah chapter 20. The next day... When Pasher released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pashur, but terror on every side. For this is what the Lord says, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. With your own eyes you will see them fall by the sword of their enemies. And I will give all Judah into the hands of the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will deliver all the wealth of this city into the hands of their enemies, all its products, all its valuables, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah. And they will take it away as plunder and carry it off to Babylon. And you, Pashur, and all who live in your house will go into exile into Babylon. And there you will die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. Isn't there a part where you kind of want to look at Jeremiah and go, yeah, you, you preach it, brother. You let him have it. This is the guy that just whooped you. This is the guy that put you in stocks overnight. This is the guy who's making your life miserable. Let him have it. But I love the fact that Jeremiah is a man who loves God. Because out of this, out of this moment of being able to come back and say to Pastor, this is what's going to happen, there's also an opportunity for Jeremiah to have a complaint. You know, sometimes I, don't th I think that it's okay for us to complain to God. We don't like to. We don't want to say, well, God, come on. But listen to Jeremiah's words in 7 and 8 of chapter 20. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. is one of the great prophets of scripture and yet there comes this moment when he's doing what God has asked him to do and he's suffering because of it and we said remember this we said he's got three friends that's all he has is three friends and so he brings this complaint to God and says God you deceived me I do what you ask me to do and all it does is bring me trouble all it does is bring me to this point where nobody wants to be around me. And guess what? The same thing can happen to you and me. When we say, hey, I think that God is asking me to go this way, not that way. And people will look at you and go, come on. What's the big deal? Come join us. It's not that big a deal. Come step over to this side. And... If you go, um, no, I think that God is calling me over here, there's a great chance that you will be ridiculed, that you'll be made fun of. And it's okay, I think, then at times to go to God and say, God, I want you to know this following you, this is hard stuff. This isn't what I thought it would be. I thought this was all about health, wealth, and prosperity, but God, this is tough stuff. 
But the nice thing about Jeremiah is he doesn't leave it there either. So let's go on to verse 9. So he goes from this complaint to this. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can not. One of the things that I love about Jeremiah is that he says this, I can't quit. God, what you have called me to, where you have brought me so far, not saying I like it, but because you brought me here, I cannot quit. And I think that that's a great lesson for the church. Because I think there are many times that we say this, it would be easier to quit than it would to continue going on. And Jeremiah is this great, uh, great example of what it means to not quit. I would love for you in your Bibles or in your, uh, your phones or your, to highlight verse 9. Because that should be every one of us. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And so we continue to live and we continue to speak. So we confront, there are consequences, we can complain, but we come to that point where we can't quit, and then let's continue on through the story. Jeremiah 20, 10, I hear many whispering, terror, terror on every side, denounce him, let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, Perhaps he will be deceived and then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fall and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. And then in verse 12, Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have committed my cause. There comes that point where Jeremiah, when he says, I can't quit, he reaffirms this commitment that he has to God. Again, remember this, it hasn't been easy. He's spoken truth and everybody dislikes him. They're hoping that he'll, he'll say something that they can catch him in so that they can hurt him, so that they can, they can kill him and get rid of him because they're tired of all that he is doing. And remember, Jeremiah does this for 40 years. For 40 years he preaches this. But he comes back to say, God, here's the thing. I will follow you. I am committed to the cause that you have laid before me, whatever it comes and whatever it is. Again, it is encouraging for you and I, because maybe today you're here and, and you are ostracized by your family. Maybe you're here today and, and you, the group of friends that you used to have, you came to know Jesus and they said, adios, we'll see you later because we're not interested in what you have. And yet you've come tonight and you say, God, I want to be committed to you, to following you and whatever that means. It's where Jeremiah was. And maybe it is where you are as well. And once he reaffirms that commitment, look what he says in verse 13. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. He's talking about himself. God, he rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Jeremiah says, yes, that is what you're doing for me. And here's what I say, that he commends meaning he praises, because you see, I gave you all C's and I couldn't put a P at the bottom of it, because it was confrontation, consequences, complaint, can't quit commitment, and then praise, but commend means the same thing as praise. Jeremiah ends up at the spot where he's able to say, God, no matter what, I will praise your name. No matter what comes, 
I am not willing to walk away from who you have invited and called me to be. I think that is an amazing lesson for each one of us who say this, I love and follow Jesus. And when times get tough and the road is hard, remember Jeremiah's story. And don't quit. Don't stop. Don't say that I've had enough and so I'm ready to walk away. And so now again, I want to ask you the question that we began with. What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart that God might be moving in you, that He is saying to you today, don't be silent anymore. What does he want you to do? For some of us, we know what it is, but we've been back for so long that we say, I just don't think I can. And so again, ask yourself this question, what is the one thing burning deep within your soul that you must speak? And whatever that is, then I say this, speak. We as Christians have been silent for way too long. And it is time that we speak. You know, one of the things that I said as we began, or as we were right at the beginning, I said this is that for many of us, we've come to a point where we're trying to get rid of our history. To, to eliminate some of that stuff that we look in the past that we go, ah, that wasn't all that good. You know that one of my favorite parts of history was the Civil War. There's something that I I love about it. There's something that I love to study about Abraham Lincoln. And one of the the highlights was um, last year when I was able to go to the Lincoln Memorial and stand there and look out over that reflecting pool that led all the way to the Washington Monument. And then I come to find out that on August 28th, 1963, a man by the, Martin Lu- by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. stood on those very steps and he spoke some words that I think are valuable for us to hear. Words that are about our history. And I think words that mean something for us today. Maybe you remember part of his speech that people refer to as the speech that goes, I have a dream. And listen to these words near the end of his speech. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. 
I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. This is our hope and this is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand together, up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And this will be the day this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so... Let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. And let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews, Gentile, Protestants, and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. And you know what that message cost him? April 4th, 1968. He was shot and, men shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. I think he did all of the things that Jeremiah did. And maybe today God is asking you to do the same thing. If God is inviting you to speak, then by all means, speak. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for time together to worship, to come and be reminded, God, that it's not always easy. This calling that you've placed before us, God, sometimes it's just difficult. And yet, God, I believe that when you call us to do something, God, you help us through it, no matter the cost. And God, for some, like Martin Luther King, cost him his life. But as he said just before he died, I've been to the mountaintop, and I have seen the promised land. And God, I pray that you would help us as followers of your son Jesus to live out these same values, the values that Jeremiah had, the values to be able to speak truth in the midst of a culture that God just chases after everything else. And so again, God, I ask you to help us to speak. Something so simple. Help us to speak. We love you, we thank you, and we celebrate you today, God, for you are good all the time. And we love you and we worship you. In your name we pray, amen. My friends, whether you're here, whether you're joining us online, one of the things that we like to do after uh, our time of, of worship in the Word is we usually give back. Well, we can't do that right now because of the way things are. So 
If you're here in person, after, if you brought an offering, you can drop it off in the baskets uh, over by the door. One of our deacons will be holding that. If uh, you're joining us online, we just invite you, uh, whether to go to Tithely and give through Tithely, you can click that button and give. Or if you want to send us an offering, you certainly may do that by sending it to the, to the church here in Sioux Falls. But with that, we are going to continue to worship as we sing. And so if, if you're here in person, I invite you to stand as we sing and we celebrate some more as we celebrate Jesus through music. to the 
Nature's. This is our last song. Thanks for being here. Well, let's sing this out, oh Lord my God. Come on. Oh Lord my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hand have made, and I see the stars.